Hello, everybody. My name is Tom McNamara. I'm the founder and CEO of Hopper. And I'm joined tonight by Nicholas Hughes and Stephanie Pfeiffer from EITR. We're going to talk to you about protecting workloads and APIs with hardened tunnels. Hopper is a cybersecurity company located in Howard County, Maryland, and we develop uh, solutions that perform automated moving target defense. And you're gonna hear about that tonight as we talk. And the key thing about these solutions is that they prevent attacks uh, on containerized workloads, keep them secure. Uh, my two co-presenters tonight are Nick Hughes, who is the co-founder and CEO of EITR Technologies. EITR is a, a regular on the Columbia DevOps uh, meetups, and they're a DevSecOps consulting agency that uh, has been working with Hopper for perhaps seven to nine months now on this project. And Nick is also uh, dual-hatted as the VP of product engineering for Hopper. So he's had a large role to play in the technology we're gonna talk about tonight. Also with us tonight is Stephanie Pfeiffer. Stephanie is the co-founder of EITR and a CTO. She is an expert in cloud-based data systems and she's really an expert too in GitLab. So you'll hear her talking a lot about what we've been able to do and how we've used GitLab tonight. So with that as introductions, uh, we can go to the next slide, Dick. So the problem that we set out to solve um, has about four dimensions to it listed here on this uh, slide. And the biggest one really is this problem that there are a vast number of workloads in the cloud and they use identity credentials such as PKI certificates that, that don't have a chain of trust in the identity of the workload itself. That the chain of trust with those credentials is actually in the certificates authority. And there's a lot of automation in getting those certificates issued so they can set up uh, TLS or MTLS uh, channels. And those credentials, not just the, the PKI credentials, but even other workload credentials like API keys and other secrets can be sniffed and stolen and misused. And that uh, that oftentimes comes from insider threats where they're positioned to have a lot of wide range of man in the middle attacks. So we're, we're trying to solve that security problem. And a lot of people think that, you know, we'll just use MTLS everywhere. And it's a great uh, protocol, but it can't be used really everywhere. Uh, the difficulty of making sure it's everywhere you need to go in the cloud is is pretty large. And there are certain cloud vendors, for example, where the MTLS is not supported everywhere. So we're looking at a, a solution that would actually give us the equivalent end-to-end -end encryption protection of, of MTLS, but without the reliance on PKI. The third problem we're solving has to do with uh, the implementation friction the difficulty of managing all of the cryptographic material associated with PKI, the certificates authorities, uh, the, the uh, secrets management, the key management systems, a lot of those things are, are cloud vendor based. And so they can raise and increase the cost of those implementations. The implementations themselves can be particularly difficult to configure and implement especially if they're outside a cluster. Inside a cluster, you know, there are good solutions for cert managers and, and um, TKI, et cetera, but outside of clusters, it gets much more difficult and costly. And that makes the ability to actually move workloads or containers between clouds or across clouds in different places. When you have these dependencies on vendor services, it gets much harder to have a portable uh, container portable workload, which was part of the original vision behind Kubernetes. Next slide, Nick. So the way we've gone about solving this is we started with a patented technology that uh, Hopper has invented it's called Codes Hidden in Plain Sight. It's both a technology and a protocol, and we'll spend some time talking about that tonight, and Nick will show a demo 
uh, later in the presentation. But essentially what it does is it builds an identity and secret credential for each workload, and it builds those credentials at the workload itself. And then we rotate those credentials at a high frequency, you know, once every session. And a session, think of a session as just the start of a conversation between two workloads. It could be five API calls or it could be 500 API calls. It doesn't matter what happens in between. We're involved right at the start uh, in rotating both credentials. And then we use the secret credential that is built. We use that as a encryption key rather than passing it to another workload for the traditional use of authentication. So the uh, special thing or the superpower of the chips technology is that two workloads can build identical keys and begin an encrypted tunnel between them without ever having a key exchange. So it's, uh, we're able to cr create these on-demand encrypted tunnels without a key exchange. And then the last thing we've done is build this all into a package that follows a sidecar pattern. So it comes in a container image that's very lightweight and easy to deploy in a DevOps friendly process. Give you an idea, go to the next slide, thanks. Uh, so we, we're gonna talk about hardened tunnels. That's the title of the presentation. And this diagram is, is meant to portray the topology that we're uh, looking at here. So you have a bank on the green circle and the gray circle, a payment processor, and, and they're both controlling their own infrastructure, their own workloads and processes, but they may not necessarily trust each other and or how each other stores their keys or their, their cryptographic material. So we have two uh, products. One is called Kerberos for the Cloud or K4C. It's the green line that you see here, which we provide end-to-end -end encrypted encryption between the two, uh, the bank and the payment processor, processor. And then within each of the those vendor uh, clouds, if you will, or their, their infrastructure environments, where they have a lot of their own workloads. They may have, have multiple clouds. They would have east-west traffic and north-south traffic. We use our other product, which you'll hear about tonight, called Extra. And Extra is the, the one that uh, we're gonna show the demo on later, but the combination of K4C and Extra really cover the full topology of what we're trying to do. Extra inside an enterprise and Kerberos for the cloud for anything that's outside the enterprise or public facing. So with that as an introduction, I'd like to turn things over to Stephanie Pfeiffer, who will talk to you about GitLab. And Stephanie is a familiar face, I know, to many of you. And uh, she's been working with GitLab for quite a while, but she'll explain how she's used it on our project here. Thanks, Tom. I'm excited to talk to you guys about how we're using GitLab at Hopper. Um, GitLab's really built up to do a lot more than just code management, and we are taking full advantage of those features. You can go ahead and go to the next slide, Nick. So we are going to start at every software engineer's least favorite part is project management. Um, and GitLab is actually giving Jira a run for its money. I'm sure everyone's familiar with that. Um, if any of this doesn't look familiar, keep in mind we are running inside of the GitLab Ultimate um, setup. Um, if you haven't checked it out, I would definitely put it on your radar because they're offering a lot of things that make your life a lot easier. Um, so at Hopper, we do project management by milestone, which is time-based, and we break all of those milestones down into segments called epics. Um, and it's really nice because GitLab has been able to enable us to link our epics. You can see in that top right-hand diagram, you can see one epic called reliable, really, ugh. well, can't speak and that's okay. Reliability and SLA is blocked by our multi-cloud GCP so that we can keep track of what needs to go out next and what is the most next important thing. Um, the diagram below that is an epic that is broken down into different issues. And you can see the little blue marks for things that are done and green check marks for things that need to be done and then red for things that are still outstanding. So when we're able to hand this over to one of our wonderful engineers, 
they're able to keep track of what they need to do next based on the dependency relationships between the issues as well as the epics. So as we plan for these large chunks of functionality, we're able to keep moving uh, without having to check in um, too much. Uh, on the left-hand side, we also have an, a sample of our labels that we put on our issues. These help us keep track of the criticality of the things that we need to do. Um, you can see, obviously, we have priority ones for bugs, confirmed issues, and critical issues. And as those pop up, as they do during every milestone, we have to attack those first. And then we can keep moving forward into our lower priorities. Um, this has been a really good way to keep track of everything that we've been working towards over the last seven to nine months over here at Hopper. On to more entertaining things. Nick, let's go to the next slide. Fantastic. So we're also making a lot of use out of the GitLab service desk. The service desk is really great because I can interface with the engineers at Hopper through email. With an exposed email address, I can send a note that says, hey, something's broken, or hey, wouldn't it be great if Hopper did this thing? Um, that email gets turned into an issue on the Hopper side, so we can track it internally. And as we need to update the customer, those comments go back out in email. So we're not adding people to our system. Uh, we're not giving additional permissions to people that wouldn't necessarily need it. We're able to live inside of our ecosystem while keeping them um, to their uh, side of their ecosystem. Um, and you can see in the screenshot we have here is my favorite part of the service desk is the templates that we're able to create. And we've created one for new tickets and also a thank you note for interfacing with our service desk. Um, next slide, Nick. Awesome. So security features. Uh, one that I'm going to circle back to that's not pictured here is the confidentiality of our issues and our projects that's exposed on the project management um, section. So we can have people interfacing with our projects, but not expose every single issue that we're doing. So if we have external users that need to come in temporarily and we don't need to expose every single thing that we're doing, GitLab gives us a great way to break down the confidential issues that we want to keep separate and also expose more public issues as they arise. Um, so if you haven't looked into GitLab security features, I, I highly recommend it because they really break down those simple things that, you know, we needed to keep track of, but maybe don't over time. Um, in the top right-hand corner, you can see our security dashboard, which just gives us an overall scoring of our projects as a whole. Um, as you can see, over the last 90 days, we have straight A's, which is great, um, but it will break down what we need to do and which projects have how many vulnerabilities, and then we can attack those as they come up. These vulnerabilities also show up in a vulnerability report. Um, it's part of the great thing that GitLab is doing to simplify our lives is exposing things like SAS scanning, DAST scanning, and compiling that into a report to let us know, you know, sure your merge request went in, but you may want to check out these vulnerabilities that may have been integrated into your baseline by some third party or by just happenstance. Um, you can see in the screenshot below just some of the old vulnerabilities that we've worked through in the past and everything from low to critical is captured by GitLab. It's really handy and really simplifies our security tier one. Next slide. Awesome. So this is my favorite part of GitLab. Um, it's their CI CD, which is continuous integration and continuous deployment or delivery. Um, and it really streamlines the way that our teams can work and continue to grow the code base without having to worry about their builds and everything. Everything is streamlined from your code builds through the workflow, through your integration with other storage capabilities like a Nexus or a container yard. Um, at Hopper, we leverage the shared runners that are exposed by GitLab. Uh, that enables us to not host any of our own infrastructure for just building. Uh, we're able to use the minutes that are given to the subscription and run our pipelines um, as needed on those shared runners. 
Uh, we take advantage of the ability to write our own custom templates. As you can see in the screenshot at the bottom, we have a mixture of GitLab provided um, templates, which are the security slash license scanning, dependency scanning, SAS. If they don't look familiar, that's because some of them are only available at that ultimate tier that we are part of. Um, but we also couple those with the standard templates that we've created to manage our own workflow, to minimize our pipelines and make sure we're using our minutes efficiently, as well as provide standard build templates for Python and Docker the way that we need to do them inside of the Hopper ecosystem. So these templates can be used generically on every project. Um, variables make it really easy to have secrets stored or be able to move between projects that have slight differences. And those are the sorts of things that we're taking advantage of from a CI CD perspective. And if we go to the next slide, we'll be able to see a snapshot of the pipelines that we're running. Um, so our pipelines are genericized to be able to run across anything. So if we have a pipeline for Python, we're gonna have your standard pre-commits, your test, your build, your deploy. And it's going to integrate with PyPy and whatever else we need to touch in order to build those things. Um, you can see in the two pictures, we have um, pre-commit and test in both and build in both um, pipeline outlines, but then we also have a deploy. So depending on the type of pipeline, we're able to act accordingly for the technology that we're integrating with. Um, we use these pipelines also to integrate with the GitLab container repos, as well as PyPy for storing our internal artifacts. And we're also able to in integrate with our external container repositories for customer facing uh, access to the stuff that we're delivering. Um, CICD has streamlined a lot of the work that we do with Hopper in that we don't have to reinvent a pipeline every time we create one and they let us use their standard templates to enhance our already existing pipelines. And I feel like that might be my last slide. So it is my pleasure to hand it over to one Nicholas Hughes to walk you through the architecture we have here at Hopper. Thank you, Stephanie. Um... So uh, it's going to be my job to go over uh, some of the, the basic architecture and uh, then start to drill down in some of the, uh, the details of the product itself. Uh, so as far as the overall architecture, a good segue from what Stephanie was talking about um, is that, um, you know, repositories that are located in GitLab that, uh, you know, all of our pipelines deliver internally to. And that's what we use in all of our testing. Um, and internal infrastructure. Um, however, we do deliver containers to customers uh, so that they can run our software. And uh, the way that we do that um, is not from GitLab directly, but instead we have a Harbor instance that we run um, so that we can um, you know, provide access through that to the customers and they can pull down whatever containers they'd like. Uh, so currently what we have is a manual promotion process uh, where all of our um, uh, tagged commits will be delivered into GitLab. And then if we want to promote a uh, particular build into uh, the customer facing repository, we can do that uh, by clicking that little uh, gear button that you can see in our deploy. Um, and that will send it over to Harbor, and then uh, customers can start using that new version at that point. Um, at some point in the future, we'll probably uh, start doing this process automatically, uh, maybe through like a canary build or something like that, um, where you know we prove that the, the software uh, didn't fundamentally break in any way, uh, and then that can be used by customers. So uh, also a real basic overview of some of our internal architecture that we used in order to deliver the services um, that our folks, uh, our customers consume. Um, it's a pretty basic architecture. Uh, here we're showing um, what it looks like inside of AWS. 
but essentially because everything is containerized, we are leveraging um, AWS's ECS uh, in order to run those containers um, in a, a pretty efficient and scalable way. Uh, so you see that we have um, you know, internet connected gateway, uh, we have an NLB or an ALB with WAF, uh, depending on what type of service is running. Um, and uh, then we run our containers in Fargate behind that. And then uh, those have uh, internet access through a NAT gateway uh, in AWS. So the great thing about delivering containers is that we have the ability to be really portable uh, between clouds. Um, so you can see here that we have uh, AWS and we have GCP. Um, you know, especially for for startups, uh, sometimes you know you can work with cloud providers in order to get certain deals, and sometimes they have better deals uh, with one than another. And so, being able to move back and forth uh, during those early stages of of the business is really important, and doing so in a um, in a manner that is stable uh, is also very important. So. Uh, what we can do is we we can have those containers we can ship around wherever we'd like and uh, with each respective cloud provider uh, we just use the infrastructure that they provide for running containers and then we can um, have like a global load balancer uh, type service through dns in order to point at uh, one environment or another My mouse has decided to intermittently not work. Um, so I won't go into a whole lot of detail on this. Um, happy to address any questions in Q&A uh, at the end. Uh, but we deploy all of our um, cloud infrastructure using infrastructure as code, which obviously is a best practice. Um, we take um, an approach with that uh, by using TerraGrunt to keep our Terraform code uh, dry, if you will, uh, and don't repeat yourself. Um, TerraGrunt also has some cool capabilities in it, uh, such as being able to deploy um, several Terraform modules uh, in different regions or clouds all at once uh, through like the, the plan all or apply all uh, commands. Uh, so we find that really valuable uh, being able to to take actions at scale uh, with TerraGrunt and then also write our Terraform in a modularized way that Terra, TerraGrunt can um, reference very easily. So uh, that was a little bit of a view of, of kind of how the sausage is made. Uh, so now it's time to look at the sausage. Um, the, Products that we're going to go over are uh, all the ones that Tom has already alluded to. Uh, we have chips, extra, and K4C. So chips is really the, the core of, of everything that we do at Hopper currently. Um, it is the, the really cool technology behind all the neat things that we do. And uh, a real brief overview of, of how that works is um, at the top, we have uh, the internet, right? The, the big cloud at the top of everything. Um, and so on the internet, uh, there's a ton of data, right? Um, all sorts of web pages. Um, and a lot of that data is, is ever changing. Uh, so some really good examples would be RSS feeds from news sources. Um, you know, the, the news cycle is really short, you know, there's always new stories coming out. Um, and so watching those RSS feeds, we can get, um, you know, new data coming in all the time. And the reason that that's important is that uh, CHIPS allows you to use changing data sources like that um, in order to derive uh, a seed for a key um, that uses AES GCM, uh, you know, normal high strength uh, encryption. Um, 
and uh, that's the the core of of that transport encryption. Uh, so, walking through the workflow, uh, we have you know two workloads uh, within an organization: um, workload A on the left and workload B on the right. Um, if a DevOps engineer configures both of them uh, to use the same chips algorithm, um, algorithm meaning just a series of steps. Um, what happens is uh, when workload A determines that it wants to talk to workload B, uh, it creates a new session. Uh, when it creates that new session, it determines that it needs encryption for that session and will reach out to um, whatever remote data source um, is located on the internet that uh, is used by its configured algorithm. So it'll reach out to that URL. Uh, it might grab a specific uh, headline from that RSS feed, and then it runs a series of transforms on the data. Um, those transforms are dictated by the specific algorithm that we've chosen, but it might do things like you know swap letters around, uh, do replacements, uh, you know potentially truncate data. Um, and once it has uh, come up with the resultant data from uh, the, the series of steps in the algorithm, uh, essentially uses that as the seed for that AES key that, that I was talking about. Uh, so now workload A went through all of those steps uh, very quickly and uh, created its key. It then proceeds in transmitting its encrypted data over the wire to workload B which receives it and says, oh, well, I'm receiving encrypted data. I don't have a key for that. Uh, let me go retrieve it. And so it reaches out, goes through the same series of steps, gets its key, and now they both have the same key on either side, and we have an encrypted tunnel between workload A and workload B. So we talked a little bit about the... Um, the encryption involved and kind of how chips works. Um, another thing that, that we're leveraging inside of our products is an open source project called Envoy. Uh, Envoy is a really popular um, network proxy and routing uh, application that allows you to do a lot of really cool things um, without uh, you know, having to, to learn a new tool, right? So uh, service mesh like Istio, uses Envoy, a lot of uh, some of your favorite products, if they're, they're network-based, use Envoy um, as the underpinnings of what they do, and you may or may not even know it. Uh, so we do utilize Envoy, and just really quickly looking at an Envoy flow, um, we have like a requester on the left and a responder on the right. Um, the requester would reach out downstream, uh, hitting at step one, um, hit the Envoy proxy, which does um, uh, offload to our application uh, in order to do the encryption. And then when we hand that data back, uh, Envoy tra um, transfers that downstream to the other end um, where another Envoy awaits um, as like a, a sidecar container that is close to the responder. Um, decrypts the data um, using the same workflow that, that I already went over, uh, and then releases that information to the responder who acts on it and responds. And then it comes back the other way uh, to the original requester. Um, so all of that is really transparent to any application on either end. And uh, very little configuration needs to happen in order to do that. Um, Additionally, because we're using Envoy, uh, any uh, configurations you can perform with Envoy itself uh, are available to you. So in addition to the, the encryption transforms that we do, uh, any additional uh, transforms that Envoy can perform natively uh, are available as well in the Envoy workflow. So. Um, I talked a little bit about how things worked uh, when we were talking about chips. Uh, so 
that's basically an extra workflow, but I'm going to work through it step by step so it's a little bit more clear. Um, so we have workload A and workload B on either side. Um, workload A has an algorithm configured uh, where it might reach out to the New York Times RSS feed. Um, it goes through all of the, the chip steps uh, that I went over earlier and derives that blue key um, that it keeps for its session to workload B. So now that it has that, it reaches out to workload B and says, hey, I got some encrypted data. Workload B says, oh, I don't have a key for that. It does the same process, reaches out to the times um, and derives the key on that side as well. So at that point, we have a session open between workload A and workload B, and we have a bunch of arrows going between them because um, we can have n number of calls, API calls, or other traffic between those workloads inside of the same session using that same key. So another product that, uh, that Tom brought up at the beginning was K4C. Um, and that's really great for two different organizations that are trying to talk to each other. So here we have org A on the left and org B on the right. Um, org A has algorithms that it configures inside of its organization, uh, just like org B does. And so, you know, that's kind of, um, you know, sensitive information that those organizations have because, you know, it's, it's a series of steps that they want to go through in order to derive a seed. Um, that key is constantly rotating, uh, but, you know, we don't necessarily want to like hand over uh, those algorithms um, to other organizations. So the, the way that we can um, have those two organizations talk securely to each other is a similar workflow to the way that Kerberos works, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and that's by inserting a, a trusted third party into the loop. Um, so essentially what we have here in the cloud now is um, Hopper infrastructure that gets a little bit more involved in, uh, in the transfer at this point. So when org A determines that they want to talk to org B, um, the first thing that org A does is talk to us. Uh, so it talks to Hopper and it does so over uh, a pre-negotiated encrypted tunnel using uh, org A's chosen algorithm. So you can see Hopper has that blue key. It knows how to talk to, to org A. Um, and so org A can go ahead and reach out to Hopper and say like, hey, um, you know me. Uh, we've talked before. Uh, we both have the keys to to the castle to talk to each other. But I want to talk to Org B. Can you set that up? And Hopper says, "Yeah, for sure. I can totally do that." Uh, so what Hopper does is we create a a key, you know, effectively a session key for Org A to talk to Org B, um, and that is that purple key up at Hopper. Uh, so, you know, org A knows how to talk to Hopper. Hopper creates that purple key and uh, gives it back to org A and says, hey, uh, use this. So org A uh, reaches out with that purple key to org B. Um, and org B doesn't really know how to interpret that encrypted data. Uh, but what it does is go through the same process uh, that org A went through. Uh, but with its green key, right? So uh, org B will talk to Hopper and uh, it'll say, hey, you know me, uh, we know how to talk to each other. Um, org A is trying to talk to me, you got a key for me? And we say, yep, we absolutely do. And we hand you that, uh, that purple key. And then org A can talk to org B. And there was um, no negotiation directly between org A and org B uh, on like a chosen secret or something like that. Um, they are using symmetric encryption using the purple key that was given to them by Hopper. And so now what we're gonna do is show a brief demo 
Um, for extra, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do this with a video because I'm worried about the demo gods smiting me. Um, so let me go ahead and share this video. This video is a recorded demonstration of Hopper's moving target defense solution that protects workloads, APIs, and data with end-to-end -end encrypted tunnels. We'll demonstrate the simplicity of deployment and how Hopper's solutions work in operation with deployed workloads in the cloud. The video is in two parts. Part one explains the organization of the YAML file and the settings that a DevOps engineer would configure at deployment. Part two is a demonstration of Hopper sidecars in operation after they have been deployed with separate workloads. I'll show how the end-to-end -end encryption occurs in each session and protects endpoints by securing the data communication. We'll also see how it blocks any untrusted connection from reaching a protected endpoint. Let's look at how easy it is for a DevOps engineer to achieve end-to-end -end encrypted tunnels for their enterprise workloads. It is a simple process of editing a YAML file when deploying a workload to production. As far as the extra product for Hopper is concerned, we are going to quickly go over the, the configuration of the product, which is pretty easy. You know, we provide some artifacts that enable point-to-point -point communication, and those can be extended for any types of communication scenarios that you might have. So just running down this really quickly, we have some Kubernetes artifacts here that we'll be showcasing, and we have a namespace that everything is going to be deployed in, a configuration map that will be used by Envoy, uh, which is you know, a very popular open source project that's used as the underpinning for a lot of Kubernetes-based projects, including Istio. So we have the full Envoy configuration syntax that's available to us, and so that outlines some real basic routing and filtering that we'll be performing in this demo. Then we have a, uh, a web server script that we'll be using to show that we have, in fact, reached the other side of a communication point-to-point -point setup. And then we have some registry credentials that we use to contact the Hopper repository for pulling down containers into our Kubernetes environment. But this secret here is really the one that uh, most customers will be interested in, and that is our license key that we use to enable features within the Extra and other Hopper products. And then the chips algorithm, we currently have thousands of algorithms that can be used with chips in order to distinctly identify the algorithm that will be used between two endpoints so that somebody can configure both of those endpoints with the same algorithm and effectively have them source identical keys independently of each other. We also have some other mechanisms here for our deployment. We'll be deploying some test containers here. You can see that we have a, a curl test, which will be sort of like the client side of our demo communication endpoints. And then we have a web server here. It's running our simple web server script, and it's going to have some text on it so that we can see that we have reached the other side of the, the tunnel, if you will. And then we have our Envoy container and our key server container, which you know comprise the, the extra product. So once we have that implemented, essentially we have uh, communication between two sides here. We have uh, on the top our Babar node, and it is reaching out to the Cornelius node. And you see it's getting a response back here. So every 30 seconds, the, the curl test container is reaching out actually locally and hitting an Envoy endpoint that is then filtering and sending it on across the internet to Cornelius. And Cornelius is doing the same thing, but in reverse. So it's getting out over to Babar, and all of this communication 
is happening over the internet in an encrypted fashion through extras functionality. So the curl command itself is not encrypted. You can see that we have, we're reaching out to an unencrypted web server. So there isn't any TLS or anything that is involved in encrypting this. It's encrypted end to end by Hopper in transit. So if we have a third endpoint in the mix and we wanted to try to connect one of our secure endpoints, you can see that if we try to reach out to Babar from our third endpoint here, which happens to be my laptop, we don't get a response back. Right now, the communication that's occurring from my laptop to that endpoint is being initiated. It goes over the internet, it goes into the extra software, and effectively, since it's not encrypted, it's being black holed. So there's no response that's coming back, which is useful when you have application endpoints on the internet. Any type of response that you have, even rejections, can positively identify the existence of an application. So we are black holing that. That's effectively being dropped. But if this endpoint was a legitimate endpoint, all we would need to do is run the extra software on that endpoint. We still cannot access the internet endpoint directly. However, what we can do is we can access our our local egress to that endpoint, which is being served up by Envoy. And you can see that we have accessed the listener port on localhost. However, we have gotten to the, the web server endpoint for Babar. Uh, so all of that encryption occurred between my endpoint and uh, the Babar endpoint. And every single session that we initiate will have a new key, potentially, uh, based upon the aggregation of internet information. So that allows me to have separate keys used between sessions on the same host, and then also between separate hosts, but all using the same algorithm. All right. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that Smarter Nick said in the video that I forgot to say while I was talking about chips was that there are uh, thousands of algorithms uh, that are all bundled in. And additionally, we have the ability to uh, define custom algorithms as well. So if you have specific endpoints that, that you wanted to um, hit and perform specific transforms on them, uh, we certainly have the capability to do that. So that brings us to a uh, question and answer. Um, I'll probably only leave this up for a second so that people in the video can see uh, that we are now at the Q&A period and then I'll uh, stop sharing so that we can see beautiful faces. But uh, if there's any questions, we'll be happy to field them now. Yeah. Uh... I'll get one to get it started and just talk into the room. Feel free to drop questions into the chat as well if uh, if you're a little shy about unmuting. Um, so Nick, you guys, it sounds like as part of the solution stack, you all run some infrastructure out in cloud vendors and deliberately took a um, like a multi-cloud approach to where you can toggle between the providers depending on whatever is the more cost-effective solution. Um, can I ask how quickly you can pivot like from one cloud to another, assuming that you've already got a footprint established in like cloud B and you're trying to switch out of cloud A? Um, you know, realistically, it's it's as fast as whatever uh, a DNS refresh period can be. Um, you know, the, the thing that you uh, specifically called out in the question though is right, like assuming it's already there. Uh, that's always the the biggest problem in in taking a multi cloud approach to anything is that um, you know you now have two different cloud providers that uh, use different language. 
and uh, you know you have to retool infrastructure as code in order to get it over there. Um, so it's it's not something where you can just decide one day that you're going to move over and and quickly pivot. Uh, it does take a little bit of work to do. Okay, that, that was actually going to be the follow up. Is like, what's it like to do that? And it's it's work. Is is what it sounds like. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I know you so well that I can't anticipate your questions. <laughs> or I'm just predictable. Uh, I've got a question for Stephanie if she if she feels like taking a, a cue. So the uh, the GitLab work, it sounds like y'all have got a really nice polished system now that works now. I'm kind of curious what kind of speed bumps, um, what sort of challenges did you guys run into while you were putting together um, the elegant solution that you've got today? Um, it's a good question. It's a little bit unpredictable, right? Um, we have run into issues already with different Python versions that we're using. Uh, we, if you saw in the screenshots, we've got testing version 3.9, 3.8. So as new versions roll out and the shared runner is great, but you're also in their ecosystem. In other environments, we've hosted our own shared runner, our own runners where like you can, can create your own environments, but um, we're trying to take advantage as much as possible of what GitLab has to offer and hoping for the best. Um, they're very receptive be to being worked with. So we're hoping that we can just help them make a great solution. That's cool, thanks. Sure thing. Uh, so I'm coming at this like as a real entry level layman here, but it seems to me as if you're looking to transfer data in a secure way from point A to point B, but you're using point C in a sense to kind of pass information through. Um, <clears throat> so is this something where like you like how are you able to transfer information into the uh section in the cloud that you guys have a relationship with and then manipulate that information through other services to pass it back to you so that is an excellent question so you're describing uh the k4c setup where it has that trusted third party um that right third party does not ever take any of the actual data in transit. Um, all it does is negotiate secure um, key transfer to the endpoints. So organization A and organization B um, really just get the keys that they're going to use to talk to each other from Hopper. Uh, once that's taken place, they're talking directly to each other. We're out of the loop at that point. So it's the communication between point A and the cloud that's encrypted, but then decrypted to communicate with the cloud to then transfer back information to point B encrypted? Um, it's more like organization A sets up an encrypted tunnel with Hopper in order to receive a key, which is sensitive information, over that encrypted tunnel. It now has the key to talk to org B. Org B sets up its own encrypted tunnel to Hopper in order to receive that same key. And then they can talk to each other, Org, B, org A and Org B directly. I always say Org B, like I'm trying to combine the two things. Um, does that make sense? No, it makes I, total I think, sense. It does. Okay. Yeah, Mike, I, I think one of the things you were... Um, Seeing was that cloud up there at the top is is not where the data goes, not where Org A is sending their data to get it down to Org B. It it's only there to supply the the dynamic uh, information that would allow it to build a uh, an encryption key so that it can communicate directly with Hopper. And the same thing with with Org B. It just needs to go to that cloud to get some random data so it can run in its algorithm and build a key so it can communicate with Hopper. All the data moves directly between the two organizations. So in a sense, it's as if Hopper is the 
uh, you know, air quotes, only requests for information as far as these third party applications are concerned. And then that information is passed to Hopper and then no one else knows where that information is going. Hopper is just an arbiter. It's all, all it's performing in that, um, you know, if say, you know, Stephanie was divorcing her husband, right? And, you know, they, they no longer knew how to talk to each other um, because, you know, just communication breakdown, man. And Stephanie came to me and was like, hey, uh, can, can you talk to Chris for me? Um, like, give me some sort of line of communication. Like, do you have his new number or something like that? Like, yeah, yeah, I can do that. So I go to Chris. He already has a new number? Yeah, of course he would. He would totally change his number. So, you know, Chris changes his number and she can't get a hold of him anymore. And so she comes to me and says, hey, do you have Chris's new number? Of course I have because, you know, me and Chris are good friends and I'm helping him through the divorce. And so um, I reach out to Chris. I'm like, hey, um, I know you don't want Stephanie to have your new number. Um, but, uh, you know, may, maybe you guys could like use this like new burner phone or something like that. All I'm doing is I'm arbitra arbitrating the communication between these two points. So like, I don't hear their conversations. I don't care about them. I'm just coordinating communication between two endpoints. But in the sense, the information is passing through you to that other avenue, right? Nope, never. No. Okay, so you're securing the line of communication, but not communicating through? Yep. Interesting. Yeah, that's why we were saying earlier, we can get these two organizations, we can get Stephanie and her husband to talk without ever exchange, exchanging a T between them. So they're not exchanging their phone numbers between them like would normally happen in a handshake process or a key exchange in TLS or MTLS. But wouldn't your service in a sense have to know some kind of like an authentication kind of pattern or code to be able to allow the communication to exist? That's the algorithm. That's the chips out. The fact that they have a, they each have their own algorithm that they've chosen out of this, you know, tens of thousands of algorithms in our sidecar, they each chosen one for themselves. And Hopper happens to know that because they've got that algorithm, they got that sidecar from Hopper. So that's why we can be the okay. broker between the two. It's like Chris and I have anonymous phone numbers. I don't know the number, but it's I can text him on it until he throws his burner phone away and I find him and I convince him to remarry me. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to work, but okay. <laughs> just joking, just joking. But okay, yeah, this this is technology beyond my uh, scope of what I've been exposed to or exposed myself to, but I think it's important to be able to communicate securely. And so I appreciate that something like this is out here. That was a savage burn on Stephanie, by the way. I'm totally going to clip this out of the video and send it to her every month. I'm going to cry myself to sleep tonight. Let's so translate it to French, then. It. We'll be fine. <laughs> Thanks for that, Mike. Uh, looking around the room, any other, any other thoughts or questions? For the speakers. Cool. Well, thanks, you guys. This is great. Um, before we call it, we'll be sure to send out some links um, to the group in an email. But where's where would be the best place for people to find y'all and keep up with the latest with y'all on the internet? So uh, hopper.co is a good place. Uh, in addition to going back to the Columbia DevOps meetup site to watch the video, we also have the video that uh, Nick showed on our website, uh, as well as some other sort of, I call them beginner videos and explainer videos of how the technology works. Uh, and there's some white papers out there too. So, and all of those are, are free to access. Uh, we do have a beta 
uh, for extra that's available now as well. So if any of uh, the viewers want to actually put this to use, they can sign up for the beta uh, on our hopper.co website as well. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, all three of us are on LinkedIn. Uh, so, you know, if you have any specific questions you want to hit up in the chat, or if you just want to connect and say hi, uh, feel free to do so. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks. Yeah, thank again. you all. And thank you for your for your uh, questions. Your uh, appreciate any feedback you want to uh, send us, and thank you for uh, participating tonight. Thank you for everything, guys. Cool. All right. Y'all have a good night. Thanks.